Hello, I am Dr. Kathleen Hall, and this is the way I see it. Well, I um, am going to go in a different direction today. I, uh, it's, uh, our podcast today is called Living in the Presence, capital P, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, Living in the, capital T-H-E, Presence. And um, what happened in this podcast, I have been a follower of Richard Rohr. He's a Francesc Franciscan priest. He um, created the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's pretty famous, infamous. He's, you know, a good friend of Oprah's and Deepak Chopra and all kinds of other spiritual and, um, you know, healers, people all over the world. So he's an amazing human. He's written... Uh, innumerable books. You, and if you don't know who he is, please check him out. His name is Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. -R. So what happened was I received this newsletter. I get a newsletter from him and he has these little sayings and quotes from his books. So I was in one direction for the podcast today. And when I read this, I went, no, I, I've got to shift directions because I think this is just so beautiful, especially uh, at this time before we enter Lent. Uh, which again, I don't care if you're Christian, I don't care if you're Buddhist, I don't care if you're agnostic, um, atheist. It's really cool that that Lent, which is 40 days before Easter, you can make that your own time. You can make that a time of creativity, change, contemplation, whether you're rethinking your marriage, your job, whatever it is. It's 40 days of just focus on whatever you need to focus on. So I thought, well, what a great time for me to talk about this uh, today before uh, any of us who enter those 40 days, like I said. I mean, my husband happen happens to uh, be very, very non-religious, but he looks forward to uh, Ash Wednesday. I, I think it's the Shrove Tuesday pancakes because he loves um, pancakes. But anyway, uh, the Wednesday before and then all the way uh, through those 40 days. I also... Uh, reflect on this now that I'm more into spirituality, of course, than religion, is all those years when I was a little Catholic girl and I got ashes on my forehead that said, to dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. It's, it has a different feeling now, of course, that I'm more mature and older because the fact is we all are going to return to the earth in one form or another. So I think the cool thing is on that Wednesday before we begin it, you actually have um, contemplate your death, your life. That's why we're talking about living in the presence today. And uh, the joy and every sumptuous thing that this earth has to offer that so many of us are missing. I mean, it's like kind of like our lives are, we're, we're on a train and there's a bunch of cool train stations and we just keep flying by them. And each train station is, you know, got a different gift, a different, you know, place of joy or, or whatever it is, and we just kind of keep racing by. So anyway, Richard Rohr wrote this, and I wanted to read part of it because I cannot paraphrase it. It's so beautifully written, and then make some comments on it. So, um, and I want to begin with this disclaimer of, of whatever the energy that, whatever you consider God or the divine or the sacred or the holy or... Um, you know, Muhammad, uh, Yahweh, uh, Buddha, whatever term you use for your higher self, for the divine, for divine intelligence, you know, that's great. Because, uh, again, teaching world religions, um, which I was a professor of, it, I, it's your concept, it's your relationship. But um, I'll refer to it to different, different images through this uh, little talk. So whatever the energy and love is that creates and drives the universe and nature and whatever your image is, your word, that that's what's really important. But again, I want to say I'll use different terms. So let's talk about living in the presence. I have a little plaque that somebody gave me, God knows, God knows, 20 or 30 years ago, and it's by the sink. So every morning when I wash my dishes and have my coffee and go to bed at night or whatever, and every meal, I look to the right and look at it. And it says on this little clay, simple plaque, it says, Love your life. It's your living prayer to God. Okay, think about that. Love your life. It's your living prayer. And when somebody gave me that, it was shocking because it took me from verbal talking prayer, you know, and especially if you're raised like I was, that you know, you memorize a thousand prayers. It 
took me from that or, or pleading for things, please, I need this, I want this, or please help me from grief or whatever, whatever it is, to realizing the unbelievable joy and responsibility of what that simple little clay plaque that one of my patients gave me. Love your life. It is your living prayer to God. God, what a beautiful thing. So um, prayer is not primarily saying words or thinking thoughts, but it, rather it's a life stance. It's a way of living in the, the presence, capital P, living in awe, living in awareness of the presence, and even of enjoying the presence. Fully contemplative people are more than aware of the divine presence. They trust it. They allow it. They delight in it. They stand in it. They bathe in it. I have spent so much of my time at different types of monasteries, whether they were Buddhist or Sufi or Christian or you name it, whatever flavor is what I call them, they relish, they live in that beautiful womb of the presence. So they immerse themselves in it, just like, again, as if you're sinking into a pool of water or, or, and drinking it at the same time because it's in and out. So the contemplative secret is learning to live now, though. The presence is now. The now is as, and again, the now is not as empty as it might appear to be. And we fear it. Many of us fear silence, being in the present, uh, listening deeply. But try to realize that everything is right here, right now. When we're doing life right, when we're doing it with love and peace in our hearts, it means nothing more than right now. Because the divine presence is in this moment. When we are able to experience that, taste it and enjoy it and bathe in it, smell it, see it, listen to it, we don't need to hold on to it because guess what? The next moment will have its own taste and enjoyment. For an example, this morning, it's almost spring, I went outside and heard the birds. I went crazy. I felt like I was in heaven on earth. And I sat there and went, oh my gosh, I don't want to leave. I have to go back in. Um, you know, have breakfast with my husband before he leaves for the hospital. I don't want to leave it. And I remembered him saying this in this, you know, piece that he sent me. I went, don't hold on to it. The next moment will have its own taste and enjoyment. Well, I come in and there on the counter by the coffee pot, my husband has left me this beautiful card about how much he loves me and how long we've been together. And I just sat there and thought, isn't it true? Think about this. When we hold on to it, if I would have held on to the birds all day long, I would have missed my dog snuggling up to me, a call I got from my sister that told me how much she loved me, a cute, adorable video of Avery, my grandchild giggling. I would have missed all those present moments if you keep holding on to something in the past or waiting for something, quote, good to happen in your future. The next moment will have its own taste and enjoyment. So be here now, because most of our moments are not tasted or fully experienced in the presence. We are never full. We create an artificial fullness, okay? Think of that. We create an artificial fullness and want to hang on to that. And again, whether it's buying a new dress, we think, oh, this is really great, or whether we eat a great meal or meet somebody new or whatever it is, that's an artificial fullness that comes and goes. But there's nothing to hold on to when we begin to taste the fullness of now, of now. The sacred presence either is now or it's not at all. Seriously. If the now has never been fully or sufficient, we will always be grasping. Here's a litmus test. If we're pushing ourselves and others around, we have not yet found the secret of happiness. This moment is as full of the divine presence as it can be. Saints, holy people, monks, priests throughout the ages, holy people that we all follow or inspirational people we read have called this the sacrament of the present moment. Yes, it's been every religion, every spirituality. Mindfulness is big, right? A huge, huge, of course, we practice mindfulness, especially at our Mindful Living Network. It's the sacrament of the present moment. The present moment has no competition, none. It's not judged in comparison to any other. It has never happened before and will never happen again. Those birds that were there this morning, however many of them that were singing to each other, that'll never happen again. It's gone. 
And that moment this morning when I opened that card with so much love in it with my husband, he may not be here tomorrow. He, you know, that may never happen again. But when I'm in competition, I'm not in love. Okay. Our whole world seems to be driven by competition, but you can't be in love with the presence when you're competing all the time. Because I can't get to love because I'm looking for a new way to dominate. Dominate my finances, dominate my body, get skinnier, dominate my marriage, try to teach my children what to do because I know what's best. The way we know this mind is not the truth, is that the presence does not deal with us like that. The mystics, again, the holy people, those who are really pray, it's every cell of their body in their own presence displaying love and peace and compassion and listening and kindness. Those who enter deeply into the great mystery don't experience a divine presence that compares me, Kathleen, with Susan or Bill or, or my house with your house and my car with your car or my child with your child. There, there, that divine presence doesn't differentiate, doesn't judge. What it does is the divine experience is an all-embracing receptor, receiver, a receiver who recognizes the divine image in each and every one of us that are made so infinitely different, yet divinely the same. And again, we can look at Jesus, we can look at Gandhi, we can look at Martin Luther King Jr., my friend Desmond Dutu, who, bless his soul, has passed, and he continues to bless us with every single thing of his presence when he was on earth. Dr. Martin Luther King, he continues with his message of peace and nonviolence. His presence still changes and transforms the world. Mahatma Gandhi, billions of people were transformed. And uh, me as a follower of his, just, it's absolutely amazing. And for Jesus, another example, prayer seems to be a matter of waiting and love, all these people. Think of holy people you have known, read about, or experienced. They live in love, returning to love always, being hated, suffering, being angry, fearful, but they return to love. Trusting that love is the deepest stream of reality. That's why prayer isn't primarily words. It's an attitude. It's a stance. It's a modus operandi. That's why Paul, in Scripture or the Bible, says, pray always, pray unceasingly. I never understood that. I went, i got to work. I've got to raise kids. I've got... You know, I've got eight million, you know, I've got horses. I've got eight million things i got to feed, take care of. Pray unceasingly. I could never do that. But it wasn't until later in my life that if we read these requiring words, it seems impossible, like it did for me. But, because we've got so, much, so many other things to do. But guess what? If you are a living presence, we can pray unceasingly. If we find the stream and know how to wade in its waters, to bathe in it, to be its essence, the stream will flow through us. And all we have to do is keep choosing to stay there. Remember, return to love, return to peace, return to nonviolence, return. Sometimes we don't have the energy to climb the stairs or jump off the dock. Wherever you are in this moment, in community, in solitude, in joy, in sorrow, with motivation, or even when you're exhausted, love and the divine essence, the sacred presence, whatever you want to call it, meets us here. Your life becomes a living prayer. And again, all these people, Gandhi, King, Harriet Tubman, all of the people that I admire, I follow, I try to emulate, that's what their lives were. It wasn't just getting on their knees or standing up or reading a prayer from a book. They lived it with every cell of their body. And the more aware you become, the more your life, your, literally, your life will be a living prayer. Think of your five senses. Okay, if you're a prayer and I'm looking right now at a tree, I'm looking at the bark in awe and wonder going, oh my God. And my, my, even my respect and awe for that tree is part of a prayer. Smelling. I woke up this morning and I smelled these camellias that I have in the backyard. So I went, oh my God, my awareness. And the living prayer for me was I planted these beautiful things and it's giving me this joy right now. Listening, listening to the birds, seeing the trees, smelling, tasting a living prayer. 
Okay, this morning I had honey from a friend of mine's bees. When I poured that over my whole grain toast, I couldn't believe it. So see, everything becomes sacramental. Everything becomes a prayer. I'm sorry, it, and it develops your awareness. When you take into your, you know, and ask yourself, what are you taking into your body? Is it drugs or alcohol or this or that or, uh, you know, what are you eating? What are you saying? How are you behaving in the world we live in? So, like I said, now that we're entering this 40 days, which, are, which is invaluable, if you can clip that off. I think it's also interesting if you study or teach uh, world religions and spiritualities. Um, you know, Christ had 40 days, uh, 40, and then the um, ancients in the Old Testament, 40 days in the desert. Um, other holy people, 40 days. It's interesting how that number, six weeks to 40 days, continues to come up over and over and over again. So there's something to it. So I find it's interesting. Remember, you can't really change a habit in a week, not even two weeks. But if you think about it, if you really commit to 40 days or six weeks, you can be transformed. So maybe, just maybe, you want to imagine your life. Imagine that Everything about your life is a living prayer to God, to the divine essence, to, to the sacred being. Whatever it is, you embody. You are the incarnation of a living prayer. It will transform your life. It has mine. So anyway, that's what I wanted to, which compelled me. And also, if you don't know about Richard Rohr, this saintly Franciscan priest who lives in the desert, Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico, please check him out. Um, with COVID, you couldn't go out there, you know, recently in the last year or so, but maybe when they open back up, it's transformed my life. I actually used his whole concept and his theology of action and contemplation in, uh, uh, in my master's dis dissertation and also my doctoral dissertation. So he transformed my life. Um, and, uh, and on that, on action and contemplation, he sees living in the presence as the contemplative part of that living in the presence, to be silent, listen, look at the world, and then the action part comes out of your silence. So if you think about everybody from Gandhi to King to uh, Buddha to Muhammad, they spent a whole lot of time in contemplation and action. The salt march for Gandhi, King, the many, many marches, Selma and all the marches uh, that he went on, Washington, D.C. But nowadays we want action, 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 action. And we don't have reverence for contemplation. That's where our taproot is. That's where our connection is. That's where you live in the present. So um, I'm going to wind this up. So just, just uh, think about it. Living in the presence and your life being a living prayer to God. So um, just... Let me remind you about our newsletter, the Mindful Living Network. Go there and sign up for our newsletter. It's great. We've got great tips, wonderful information, and great things on the site. And don't forget the meditation room. I love our meditation room. It's got everything in it. You can meditate with cherry blossoms or a bird or on the ocean or in Mount Fuji. It's very cool. Uh, contact me. Go to the Contact Me button and tell me something, and I'll get back to you. And also tell me what you'd like to hear or if you have an idea for a podcast. Um, and remember, the tagline or the, the mission under the Mindful Living Network, if you look at our site, is one people, one planet, one future. It is our world. Let's hold our hearts and hands together and heal ourselves and our world. Also, please share the Mindful Living Network with your friends and family and community. Let's do this together, okay? Let's do it together. We also have an app. It's Mindful Living Network app. You can go to the app stores, either one, Android or uh, Apple. And we have stress tips. We've got the meditation room on there. Got great stuff on there. It's wonderful. And follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. So um, thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Because, see, living in the presence, I have been here with you for these treasured moments. And I feel you. I I, uh, you're part of my heart. You live in the cave of my heart. So thank you. Um, and this is The Way I See It, and I am Dr. Kathleen Hall. <laughs>